If God had sought a deliverer of his people from Egypt in the way we might seek a deliverer, somebody would take on a big job like that. If God had done it the way we would do it, um, he may have issued a job listing. And it might have looked something like this. Wanted, a bold and confident leader of people. Must have experience organizing and motivating large groups of people. Must have a record of people wanting to follow him. Above all, must firmly believe in himself. <laughs> because it's a tough job. And if you don't believe in yourself, who else is going to believe in you? You know, And that's how the world would look at this. I've seen some uh, job descriptions for pastors that aren't far from this. Uh, and uh, this is the way the world would do it. But whom did God choose to carry out this monumental task? He chose a man who had fled for his life in fear from Egypt 40 years earlier, who had gone off and lived in the sticks somewhere in Midian, uh, had married a, a woman of Midian uh, and uh, the daughter of a priest of Midian, uh, had become a shepherd of his father-in-law's sheep, which would have entailed days and nights in solitude, uh, leading the sheep around to pasture and water. He had led sheep, but he hadn't led people. <laughs> and he's a nobody from nowhere at this point. He doesn't fit the qualifications of this wanted ad, this job description. He, God picked a man who tried to turn the job down. He picked a man who tried hard to turn the job down. A man who feared that no one would believe him. That no one would follow him. That he didn't have the voice that was necessary to do the speaking work that was associated with this job. A man who eventually, after all of his ex excuses were exhausted and God was having none of it, stepped out, obeyed, with God saying, I will be with you, expecting success by the hand of God, and it all landed with a thud. And the people got mad at him because Pharaoh got mad at them because Moses had dared to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. And that's where we are in this scenario where, that we've arrived at in Exodus chapter 6. Now, a human boss might say, you know, Moses, it's clear that I made a mistake here. I should have listened to your objections. You knew more, you knew yourself better than I knew you, but I thought I saw something in you. But clearly you're not the man for the job. So please, oh please, don't try this again. I'll put another ad in the paper and we'll find somebody else, somebody qualified to do this work. That's what a human boss might have said. But what did God say? God said, get back in there. I'm not done yet. We're doing this. <laughs> our ways are not his ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. God knows what true success is. God defines what true success is. And God knows that he can work with someone who doesn't fit man's job description. In fact, in many cases, God probably can work better with someone who doesn't fit man's job description. God has often done great things through somebody who doesn't fit man's job description. A uh, thought just came to mind, I wasn't planning to say this, but D.L. Moody, the Billy Graham before there was Billy Graham. I mean, he had... You had Billy Graham, you go back a little bit, you have Billy Sunday, and a lot of people have problems with him because of the whole prohibition alcohol thing, stand against him. It's mostly the world that has a problem with him. Then you got D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody 
pro may have spoken to more people in the name of Jesus at his point in history than anybody. The United States and Great Britain and um, just thousands of people coming to faith. I have seen writing that D.L. Moody did that wasn't cleaned up by an editor and you cannot understand it. The man was virtually illiterate as, as far as being able to write something out. And um, nobody would say, that's the one who's going to lead the campaigns to reach the United States and to reach Great Britain. Moody just stepped out, did what the Lord was leading him to do, and God used him. And God, throughout history and throughout the scriptures, does that kind of thing. He doesn't put one ads like that in the paper that exalt the person that's being called to come and do the work. God knows what true success is and he knows that he can work with someone who doesn't fit man's job description. See, what man would want to do is say, okay, here's what we need. Pharaoh, Pharaoh, he's a proud man. He believes he's a God and he's a powerful man. So we got we to gotta play to his pride. You know, we got to go in there and stroke his ego, you know. Yeah. And then maybe we'll make some headway with him. So they're going to send in the person who's going to go and, well, Pharaoh, you're great. And uh, I acknowledge that, but, you know, our people, we really just want to go worship our God. I mean, oh, oh, your holiness. Yes, I, I understand, you know, and just go and grovel before him and pretend that his pride is something and stroke that ego and uh, because the end result is what matters in man's mind. As long as the people cross the border uh, to go into the wilderness to worship or to go somewhere else, <laughs> that's all that matters. Or another person that man might send in is your negotiator. <laughs> Come on, Pharaoh. Let's reach across the table here. You put that hand. Let's shake on this. We got a deal, right? Come on, Pharaoh, shake on this. We give a little, you give a little, you know. There's a lot of us. You got to contend with that. Come on, Pharaoh, let's make a deal. Let's, you scratch our back, we'll scratch your back. But God doesn't want any of that. That's the way man does things. God doesn't want that in dealing with Pharaoh. God doesn't want somebody to go and stroke his pride. God hates pride. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. The, the way is not to go to a person who is swimming in the sin of pride and endorse that for my own gain. And it's not to go and negotiate the things of God. God doesn't send Moses in to stroke Pharaoh's pride. God doesn't send Moses in to negotiate with Pharaoh. Man might send in someone with a PhD in diplomacy, but God sent a shepherd from the sticks with a demand. A demand to a man that no one makes demands to except other kings that want to go to war with him, maybe. And the demand was, let my people go. Moses was wrong for the job by man's standards, but not by God's standards. Why? A couple of reasons. One, because God chose him. <laughs> that makes him right for the job. God chose him. Very personally, he chose him. And then number two is because true success comes not from the person doing the work for the Lord. True success comes from the Lord. And that's the title of this message. Success comes from the Lord. It's the Lord working through that life that is yielded to him who brings the success that brings glory to his name. And that doesn't just mean success in the ministry, quote unquote, it means success in life. 
you know, Joshua said to the children of Israel uh, after Moses had died and Joshua takes his place and he says this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate on it day and night for then you will have success he says if you are meditating, because if you're meditating this, it's going to govern your thoughts, it's going to govern your decision making, you're going to do things God's way, and that's where success lies, even if in the short game it looks like failure. Overall, what's God looking at? Because <laughs> that is going to determine what a success. So we saw last week, we dipped our toe into this chapter, we looked at verse 1, because it was God answering Moses uh, depressed, <laughs> arguing with him about how this mission needs to be abandoned, these people. But why have you done this to these people, Lord? Why have you let Pharaoh do this to them? We're only trying to do what you said to do. And God had said in verse 1, now you shall see what I will do. What I will do. To Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out. You know, that's the thing the people fear about Pharaoh. He's got a strong hand. This guy's got a hand that could pulverize us if he wants to. The hand metaphorically. And God says, Yeah, that strong hand you fear, that same hand's going to push you out of the land. Because I'm going to make it happen. With a strong hand he will send them out. With a strong hand. Uh, and, and he will drive them out of his land. So the words that follow from God as he continues talking to Moses expound upon this and give some ideas of how to walk in success in God's eyes. And the way I want to frame this is a three-step procedure for finding God's success in life we can find in this text, in God's words to Moses here. So step one for finding God's success in life is to recall God's activity. Activity seemed like I wrestled with that word, but I mean God's promises, God's provisions, God's deliverance, the God's activity in your past, God's activity in the world's past, God's activity in the scriptures. Recall the things that God has done, God's activity. Look at uh, verses two through five. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Now the word Yahweh is used in one of the places where God is making his covenant with Abraham. But God has appeared to Moses in a different way. And by appear, I mean manifest himself. With Moses, it was through the burning bush. Um, with Abraham, there was, a, there was a pot that went between the carcasses of the animals. But Abraham was asleep while that was happening. You know, so uh, God didn't visibly appear to all of these people, but he did manifest his presence to them. He made himself known to them. The word Yahweh is used with Abraham, but it's used with Moses when Moses say, what's your name? Who should I say sent me? And he said, I am. You tell them I am sent you. And that is a whole different level of personal <laughs> reaching out to Moses where this name was used. And so I think that's how we can distinguish uh, between uh, Moses being the first one that God appeared to by the name Yahweh because it's the name of emphasis that was used um, when he goes on he says I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan the land in which they lived as sojourners moreover I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves. And so what is the activity of God here that Moses can look at as he's looking at this ominous task of moving forward in this 
job, the scary job of confronting Pharaoh again. It's like, boy, that's something you do once in your life. You say, I did that, and we can build a monument to me because I had the guts to do that, but I'm never doing it again. And yet Moses is going to go back again and again and again because God wants him to. And so what can you look at in God's activity in his life, in the life of his forefathers, the lives of the people he's wanting to deliver, that says, okay, I should go ahead and step into this, that, that buttresses his, his courage to step up and do this. Um, well, God says the things that he has done. He's the God who made himself known to the forefathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these legends among Israel. And this story, these stories must, must certainly have been handed down through the generations. Uh, and and uh, he's made himself known to these forefathers, the forefathers of Moses, the forefathers of these Israelites who Moses has come to deliver. Uh, his interactions with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were legendary, but not as personal as with Moses. Moses, you got a special deal here. I'm the God who met you in this way. Same God who met you in this way, who had you take off your sandals because you were on holy ground. I'm the same God who spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who made these promises about land. Same God who's saying, go in and talk to Pharaoh now. God had promised Israel land. And so we see the things he's done. He has revealed himself over the course of history. He has made a covenant to give these people land. He has, he, he mentions in here, I have heard their groanings. And so that's why Moses is here showing up because the people have cried out to God for deliverance. And um, these are all things that all can inform how these people respond to this situation. They're not responding in light of recalling God's activity. They're more focused on Pharaoh's activity and they're more focused on the activity of the taskmasters who are making them go get their own straw <laughs> to make bricks. They're not recalling God's activity. And um, here's the interesting thing. The fact that God had promised them land and that land was in Canaan, not in Egypt, means that if, when God one day keeps that covenant, they're going to have to leave Egypt. So at some point, this is going to have to happen. And that's what this is all about that we're looking at now. It's about us leaving Egypt. Okay, maybe we have our pros and cons column that goes in the pro column you know and and um, isn't it interesting if they stop and think about it they've just been praying for deliverance I mean they've been crying out to God very recently and who shows up but somebody who says God has met with them and told him to come deliver them sounds like a coincidence it's either a coincidence or it's the hand of God at work. And so let's tuck that one away. Uh, if they would stop and recall God's covenant, if they would stop and recall their prayers, if they would stop and recall the meeting Moses had with them just yesterday and how all of these things, one thing leads to another, this makes sense that this is happening now. If they would recall God's activity, past and present, they might all move forward with what God wants to give them. That remembrance. Today, if we were back to the point of doing communion, today would have been for that. And that is a remembrance or a recalling of what Jesus has done for us. Same idea. And sometimes we forget and when we forget the things of the Lord, we begin to see the things of the world around us, or we begin to remember memories from our past 
that override what God would want to do in our lives. Times we've been hurt, times we've been mistreated, or things like that. Rather than recalling God, which overrides all of that, our beloved little creature, Poppy, (laughs) our little terrier mix, somewhere back in time, somebody must have done something to her. We did rescue her. She was, well, she was a year old when we got her. She was rescued out of a kill shelter in Kentucky. And so, and we look at her as, this is like the sweetest little thing we've ever, how, how did anybody even give her up? I mean, you know, there could be all kinds of reasons, financial or whatnot. Or maybe she just had really bad owners. And the way she reacts when I go to put her harness on to take her for a walk, which is her favorite thing in the world, makes me wonder if somebody has mistreated her in the past with a harness or a strap, that, like a leash or something. I took a video of me putting her harness on. I want to show you that. And as the Wizard of Oz said, pay no attention to the fat man behind the curtain. Uh, the focus here is is on Poppy. Can you imagine being mean to that? <laughs> Watch how she reacts. And she comes with a big smile, though. by peace. Because if Poppy were able to reason this through, if she were able to say three or four times a day, my daddy puts this thing on me and he talks sweet to me and he pets me and he makes it as gentle as possible. And then we go outside and everything's great. But every time it's the same thing. There is something, I'm convinced, something somewhere back in her memory that dominates until all of that is done. If she would just recall daddy and not recall somebody in Kentucky who mistreated her somewhere back in time, uh, the whole experience uh, would be better for her, I think. So, but we do the same thing. We do the same thing with God. We don't, we don't recall God. We let God's love and care and protection and provision, even when we've struggled through things to eventually see, oh yeah, the hand of God was there, I can see that now. Uh, We let the other things that strike fear in our hearts and make us just withdraw and spin our wheels and say, I'm not even going to try, we let those things uh, dominate sometimes. And that is certainly not any kind of a measure uh, for success. Um, 
When we recall God's activity, we're strengthened to walk by faith. And success lies in walking by faith. His activity chronicled in scripture, his activity uh, over the course of our lives, his activity uh, in the testimonies that we hear from others. And like I said, this is what the communion table is about. We, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. I'm using the word recall because it only has two syllables and it fit my outline, but it means the same thing. We're recalling, recall what the Lord did for us. And it, and it, it says, oh yeah, there's love unimagined that he has towards me. And, and Paul says, uh, uh, when he's talking about communion, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Paul puts the future hope, links that to this whole thing. So we don't just, oh, it's first of the month, first Sunday of the month, time for communion. Yeah, Jesus died on the cross. I remember that. We, yes, yes. Oh, thank you, Lord. But it's all, it, we, if we understand we're doing this until he comes, we're also focused on the fact that he's going to come. And there's going to be all of our hope realized in that time. So recalling what he did for us points us to what he's got waiting for us. And then we walk by faith and we know his success as we allow him to work in our lives. So recall God's activity and then secondly believe God's promises. That's step two for finding God's success, is to believe God's promises. Look at verses 6 through 8. So it says, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, and with great acts of judgment. I will Take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from burden, under the burdens of Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses will do these things for Moses and Israel. No, Moses is going to obey and he's going to be the human agent. And if you're looking only through the eyes of the flesh, it will look like Moses is doing these things. But who's really going to do these things for Moses and Israel? He begins that passage with, I am the Lord. And he ends it with, I am the Lord. And all the promises are in between. It is the Lord, the Lord God, Yahweh, the covenant maker, who will do these things for the people, for his people, uh, whom he will make to be his people. They're already his people in a sense, but they're going to become an identifiable nation with their own land and laws and everything, and God will be their God. These I have these underlined. There are seven I wills in here. Eight I wills in the whole passage if we went back to verse 1. But, but in this section here where God is making these promises, seven I wills of what God is going to do for his people. It's pretty it's something when you underline them all. And I circle the word I in every one of them. But let me put it on the screen. Just watch these things unfold. I am the Lord. I will bring you out. I will deliver you from slavery, redeem you, take you to be my people, be your God, bring you into the land, give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. That's a whole lot of promise going on there. And believing God's promises. This is what the God who spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is saying to the people on this day saying it to Moses and wanting Moses to go and tell the people that I'm going to do all these things for you. It's all predicated on who he is. I am the Lord. That occurs four times in these 13 verses. When you see things recurring like that, that means something. 
The focus here is on him. The focus is not on Moses. The people are focusing on Moses. Moses is focusing on Moses. And they're all focusing on Pharaoh too. I am the Lord four times. I will eight times. Believe God's promises. See, false promises are lies and it's impossible for God to lie. So God doesn't give false promises. He's perfectly righteous. And when he says, I have remembered my covenant, he says that in verse 5. I have remembered my covenant. That doesn't mean he said, oh yeah, that covenant, oh, I was hundreds of years ago, but you know, I just remembered, I made a covenant. That's the way we might use the word remembered. His, the, the word remembered in this sense means I'm going to act on that covenant I made all those years ago. I haven't forgotten it. I know all about it. I'm waiting for the right time and the time is now. I have remembered it. It's the same as saying I'm about to do it. Now, what are some professions in this world where you have a hard time trusting them. You feel like you're going to get ripped off. Used car salesman. Used, <laughs> used car salesman. Okay. Any other ideas? <laughs> Lawyers. Lawyers. <laughs> yeah, lot, lots of them. In particular, politicians. Politicians. I looked up this question online and all of these <coughs> came up in like the top 10 of every list in every magazine that has published such a list. You know what else comes up a lot? Pastors. <laughs> Pastors in one list were in there. Like the second least trusted profession. In most lists, they're still in the trusted side of things, but less than they used to be. Because there have been a lot of scandals. The one that I always think of is auto repairs. Because, man, if you don't know the person, they've got you where they want you. Oh, that noise you're hearing somewhere? It could be some little thing that needs to be tightened down. They could do it in five seconds and charge you 20 bucks. But, oh, no, you need a new transmission <laughs> or, or something like that. It's like $2,000 later. That's what I think of when I think of used car salesmen. But not these guys. This is not a commercial for them. The Nye Auto Doctor and McHenry. We, somebody recommended them to me as capable and honest years ago. So we've taken our, once we went there, we never have gone anywhere else. If we've ever thought, I have had times when I've thought, uh, you know, maybe a church was acting like they might call me a kind of candidate or something and we might move and I'm like but where are we going to find an auto mechanic I can trust <laughs> I wonder if Nikki Nye knows somebody in Timbuktu <laughs> and can recommend them you know, because I trust anything he tells me we have gone in with those issues and he said oh that's just a screw that needs to be tightened down before we go in and he says yeah that's your such and such is starting to go but uh, look, you probably got six months left in it so I, sometime between now and then I'd take care of it, but if money's tight right now, you don't need to jump on it right now. It's still got some use left. It tells us stuff like that all the time. Totally. I, I, would, I have said I would trust this guy with my life. I certainly trust him with my car. So they're trustworthy. If they tell me something about my car, I believe them because they've proved to me that I can believe them. Now, like I said, this is not an ad for them. It might sound like it at this point, but uh, I wanted to explain why I trust whatever they tell me about my car. Because it's a proven thing. Now, we may struggle with waiting on the Lord. We may wonder, where is God? God hasn't come through for me this time and stuff like that. But down the road, hindsight, when we look back, it's always like, wow. I can see where I would have gone if I veered off in that direction that I wanted to go in. Or, and, and God has been with me all along. Sometimes I didn't even realize it. But he's there and he's proven himself. So 
we use step one in this message, which is recall God's activity, to bolster step two, which is believe God's promises. It's the same thing we saw David doing when he was faced with Goliath. And nobody thought he could go out and take on this giant warrior. And he said, I've been a shepherd and the lion and the bear would come and, um, and, I, would, and, and I would protect the sheep from the lion and the bear. God enabled me to do that. God's going to enable me to take on this Philistine. And I always like to call that a little treasure box of memories of God's work in our lives. That, that's what... Uh, that, that's what we need. The recalling helps us with the believing. Now, God is going to use this incident that he's setting them up for here throughout the rest of the Bible to remind them of who he is. And I want to point out verse 7 where he says, um, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. That right there becomes almost a creed to Israel. So we jump down to Exodus 20 where the Ten Commandments are given and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Same thing. Out of the house of slavery. Therefore, here's how to live. <laughs> and we go to Leviticus 26, 13. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slave. And I have broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. So you were bent over in your slavery. I have brought you out and, and enabled you to make this journey and take this land and live under my rule. Because I'm the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. We go to the Psalms, 81.10. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. You know, I'm the one who took care of you then. I'm the one who will take care of you now. That's recalling, therefore believing. And that occurs all over the Old Testament. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. We have a promise that can hang over everything in our lives, come what may. Philippians 1.6 He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. It will happen. No matter what happens between birth and death, He has begun a good work in you brought the salvation that you have and the, the future hope you have in eternity and he who began that good work will bring it to completion everything to do with it including living with him for eternity will happen that hangs over everything and if we recall that promise and we believe that promise then we walk in victory and find success we might have otherwise cowered away from so, recall God's activity, believe God's promises, and then thirdly, follow God's instructions. Follow God's instructions. That's step three for finding God's success. Verses 9 to 13. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel. In other words, what God just told him to say, he went and told them what God had just told him to say. But they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So the Lord said to Moses, go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. God will not hear any of it. Go. I'm with you. I will accomplish this. 
And Moses is, oh, the people don't believe me? Pharaoh's not going to believe me. And the thing about I'm a man of uncircumcised lips, nobody knows exactly what that means. Circumcision was the covenant, the sign of the covenant relationship with God. And so uh, maybe Moses is saying, um, you know, it, it looks like I don't have this covenant and this job because I keep speaking and nothing's happening. I don't know. That's just my guess on it. But he's arguing with God. He's afraid to go in and do it. And um, he tries to obey, hits a brick wall. He tells God there's no way, and then God says, do it. <laughs> That's the summary of the last couple chapters. And, you know, it's like God is saying, I didn't ask you if you thought it worked Moses. I just said, go do this. I, it doesn't matter what the people say. Are you going to determine whether or not to obey me on what the people think? It doesn't matter what Pharaoh says. This is between you and me, Moses. Obey me. And that's what it always is with the child of God. It's between us and God. God's ways are often like this. I mean, you, you just ask Gideon. Uh, the, the Lord, angel of the Lord came to Gideon and said he was going to deliver Israel from the oppression of the Midianites. And Gideon said, oh, wait a second. You know, I'm the smallest, I'm, I'm the least significant in my family, and my family is the least significant in our clan. And so you like come to the worst person possible. But no, the Lord knows what he's doing. He had called Gideon. And a number of things happen that I won't go into. Gideon winds up submitting and puts out a call for soldiers and 32,000 show up. So he's all ready to, once he verifies once again with God, are you sure you want me to do this? <laughs> And he's, he's ready to go out, and the Lord says, uh, one problem, your numbers are too big. They're going to think they did this. And I'm the one who's going to do this, Gideon. So tell everyone who's afraid to go home. So Gideon does that. 22,000 go home. He's left with 10,000. Now, remember that Along the way in this story, we're told that, that the, the camels of the Midianites, I think it was the camels, were like uh, innumerable. The, the soldiers were like uh, sands on the seashore. 32,000 wasn't enough. 10,000 is certainly not enough. But the Lord says, still too many. And so he gives getting away to do it. Take everyone down to the brook, have them get a drink of water. Those who get a drink of water one way, send them home. Those who do it this way, take them with you. And he's left with 300. And he defeated the Midianites. <laughs> God goes to the least person and gives them this, an, an unimaginably small army to work with and defeats the Midianites. God does that again and again and again. So in living the Christian life, when a single person is waiting for marriage and everyone else is saying, what are you doing? That's psychologically damaging. That's old fashioned. That's, you know, and, and they're waiting for marriage before they engage in certain activities. And uh, because God says so, and the world looks at that and says, man, you're losing out. And God looks at that and says, that's success. And when a salesperson loses a deal because the salesperson is honest. And the honesty exposed something that the buyer didn't want, and so they backed out. And you lost maybe the deal of the year, but you weren't going to lie because the Lord is your God. And he says that lies are of Satan. And the boss might say, man, you lost. In fact, I don't know if I can keep you on here, but God would say that's victory. That's success. And 
When a believer is faithful to Christ in the face of persecution and dies for that, the world would say, what a shame, what a loss. What, all they had to do was just tell them, okay, I deny Christ and then go live for Christ without that person knowing about it. But they won't dishonor the name of Christ to, their, to those who are trying to force them to do that. And the world would look at that and say, what a loss. And God would say, that's success. In fact, I have a crown waiting for you for that. Follow God's instructions. These three steps that we've looked at. Three step procedure for finding God's success in life. And they all work together, as we've seen. When you recall God's activity, you find him faithful. And so you're encouraged to believe God's promises, no matter what. And it's in going with the Lord and doing things the Lord's way, or following God's instructions, because you believe his promises, because he has proven himself to be true, and you know who he is. That's where you find success. And it's a success that comes from the Lord. Let's pray. We bow before you, Lord, and pray that these things might be true in our lives for your name's sake. We pray in that name. Amen.